Hey guys, thank you. Uh, welcome back to the show. And I have got a fellow GoBundance member with me, Mr. Josh Hatter. And then uh, Josh and I are in uh, the Mastermind GoBundance group together. And the reason that I have him on here today is because of a very interesting Facebook post he put into our group. And, uh, and I've got it over here on the other screen. I want to read to you and then I'll let him expand on a little bit. But um, he is currently on a podcast tour. He's getting his name out there. He's doing these types of interviews. But his his claim to fame, and I'm really excited about diving into this, is growing a $30,000 401k loan to over $5 million in 10 years while investing in, in real estate, typically short-term rentals and bed and breakfasts. Did I get that correct? Absolutely. Yeah. It was uh, an interesting journey. It's probably not something your financial advisor would tell you to do to borrow <laughs> from a, uh, an account you're going to have to pay taxes on, uh, you know, and and head down the path that I did. Although, you know, having been in GoBundance now for the last couple of years, I realized I, I could have done that uh, probably tax-free if if I had access to uh, to our group there. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, live, live and learn. Certainly made a lot of uh, mistakes along the way, but uh, been fortunate enough to uh, be right a lot bigger than I've been wrong over the last 10 years. So the, the last... So you quit you quit a, a very well paying W two job. What about two years ago? Yeah, uh, December. I'm not even actually December nineteenth of twenty twenty one. Okay, uh, but yeah, but making uh, my base plus salary was like two hundred thirty one thousand. So you know, certainly not um, too shabby. But yeah, um, you know the the phrase I use is soul sucking corporate America. Uh, <laughs> and so I, I spent a dozen years of the twenty working for Fortune five hundred companies and. Uh, you know, where you spend 20 or 30 hours a week in just in like standing meetings for whatever reason. Um, I think just so that, you know, nobody can come in and break things too much um, provides for some uh, some pretty predictable revenue streams for those large guys. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, they're really there to mitigate their downside. So you're you're kind of kept in a box. Um, and so, yeah, it didn't didn't take me too long. It took me a while, I think, to figure out um, how I wanted to exit it. Um, uh, but yeah, I think I knew, uh, for probably the last 10 years, um, uh, that I wanted to head, head down, down a path that would help me, um, exit corporate America. So let's, let's dive into that a little bit. So maybe, maybe take us back to maybe a year, maybe two years before you made the exit. And then we'll talk about what that transition looked like, because there's probably lots of people that are going to be listening to this or watching this that may be in the same boat as you, you know, contemplating leaving their W-2 and sort of what that looks like and how to how to formulate it, put a plan together for them to move forward. Sure. Yeah. I mean, it's it's super intimidating. Um, and you're right. I am kind of making this podcast tour now. It's really important to me to kind of tell the story a little bit um, yeah. these days. And, and, uh, and frankly, just telling the story and kind of giving people that en encouragement, I think, is a way to give back. But um, all too often, I feel like when you're making a major life change like that, um, it's the people that are closest to you that may not be supportive or are detractors. Um, I was fortunate, you know, not at the time um, being married. I am married now. Um, got married in October, but, you know, wasn't married and didn't have kids. And so, you know, a lot of the sacrifices I've made over the last 10 years, I probably wouldn't make again at this phase of my life. So I, I did have uh, kind of that upside of just, you know, the phase of life that I was in, uh, but also having a very supportive uh, then girlfriend, now wife, um, you know, in, in planning that exit, um, you know, some people aren't so lucky to have the people closest to them um, be as supportive as I think she was. So I'm super grateful for that too. Uh, but yeah, I mean, that's, I, I was also frankful, frankly, um, you know, you mentioned the short-term rentals, um, I started my very first short-term rental was in um, 2012, got shut down almost immediately. It was actually uh, against the HOA. Uh, <laughs> so there's was, there was a guy that was retired there. Um, I lived in a little complex with like a dozen residential condos in downtown Charleston. And, uh, you know, he was retired and around every day. So at some point he saw people walking in and out. And so it didn't take me too long to get shut down. Uh, but that was long, even long before the proliferation of Airbnb, frankly. Um, so, yeah. you know, when I started doing that, uh, kind of my line is uh, some of my old college buddies would quite literally laugh in my face like you're doing what renting out your house. Um, and now, you know, you can't 
you know, watch a podcast or, or, uh, you know, look at a, a YouTube channel without seeing some type of house hack with an Airbnb side hustle type of thing. Right. Uh, so that was kind of my first foray into short-term rentals. Didn't last very long. I tried a, a few other entrepreneurial endeavors that quite frankly failed over the next few years, um, as many entrepreneurs do when they're starting out um, and kind of got back into short-term rentals in early 2016, uh, February 24th of 2016, actually. Uh, by that point, had sold my little condo and bought a three-bedroom house, um, again, in downtown Charleston, and uh, started renting a, out of a bedroom in there, and uh, probably over the next like 12 to 18 months, moved out, converted the whole thing. Um, at some point, sold that, bought a duplex, uh, bought another duplex with a partner, and then um, you mentioned the bed and breakfast. Um, I kind of consider myself um, more of an information arbitrage guy than a, a short-term rental specific guy. And I think I know what that looks like now, having had people laugh at me when I first started doing Airbnb and, and uh, you know, and VRBO in 2012. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you know, I think there's a similar opportunity um, in the asset class of bed and breakfast, actual bed and breakfast. Um, it's funny, when I started Airbnbs, you kind of had to explain what that was. Um, and now those are so popular that I almost have to explain, no, I'm talking about an actual bed and breakfast. Um, so kind of uh, moving up the value chain um, in hospitality, as I like to say. So uh, you'd mentioned information arbitrage. Tell us a little bit about that. What does that mean? Yeah, I think it's really taking information that you believe in, creating a thesis, uh, finding data to support that thesis. Um, and having asymmetric risk reward opportunity. Um, you know, I didn't feel like I had a lot of downside at the time when I started this, but the upside was tremendous. Um, and it took a while for the ecosystem around short-term rentals to catch up. So, you know, your states and local municipalities, once they realized they could um, collect tax revenue um, from this, right, that took a while just to get those systems and processes in place. Uh, there's litigation. I mean, there's there's still, um, I would say, immature markets um, as far as short-term rentals are concerned that are going through this process. Um, in fact, somebody just filed a lawsuit um, at one of the beaches here outside of Charleston. So, you know, you have that uh, kind of maturity process, which adds an element of risk, right? I think the the more mature the uh, the legal environment um, and the bureaucratic environment, um, the the better chance you have at some stability and being regulated and not having a ton of illegal properties. Um, so, you know, that, that was kind of how it was in the beginning when I started 10 years ago. Um, and, you know, you have risks associated with information being uncommon. Um, and even the banks, the banks kind of didn't know how to evaluate these deals, right? All they know is I, it's a single family home. Why would I, uh, why would I base it on um, you know, vacation rental income. How is that consistent? You know, um, and and I think really kind of revisited that um, that skepticism during COVID as well too. It was definitely hard to get a, a loan on a vacation rental during 2020. Um, but there's just so much more maturity in the whole ecosystem around short-term rentals now. And so, from my perspective. Um, that information gap is not what it was 10 years ago. Mm-hmm. And so that's compressed return. So you have the Fed's easy money policy over the last decade. Um, now uh, r- rates have effectively doubled over the last year, right? Um, and you have rising asset prices over the last decade too. So um, all of those things have um, compressed returns and it's just not uncommon anymore. Um, I feel like I, I hear about somebody trying to get into short-term rentals every single day. Um, at this point. So um, bed and breakfast, there's a little bit of, um, I think, a similar opportunity, in my opinion, at least that's what our data shows initially with these first couple of deals. Um, I think there's a little bit of a competitive moat uh, because people don't necessarily want to, um, you know, want to set up breakfast. It is a more labor intensive asset class. Um, And so it's just a little bit different uh, than the short-term rental space. It's not as easy to uh, throw up a listing on Airbnb and serve your typical bed and breakfast uh, demographic. So, um, so take me, take me back. Let's, let's go back to the short-term rentals. So, you know, somebody sent me a, a tweet the other day or something like that. You know, I've got a son that's getting ready to go off to college and and, and, you know, it's, it's crazy. Cause you know, when we, we went to college back in the day, 
you know, it was like, if you want to, if you want to make good money, you got to go to school a long time, you know, law school, medical school, dental school, get this big degree, maybe taking on a lot of debt. If you really want to take, make a lot of money, really specialize into something. But, you know, now you see, you know, 18, 19, 20 year olds, millionaires on YouTube, you know, it's not uncommon. Totally. So, so I, you know, I was, uh, I saw this tweet and it said, literally when you, you know, they recommended that this is what they were teaching their kid, get out of high school, buy a duplex, you know, if, you know, they, they were going to go to college, but buy a duplex and live in one side and rent out the other side. And, and this is, this is what he said. He was really, this guy was really big into short-term rentals. And he said, look, if I had to do it all over again, this is what I would do. And then after you kind of get your feet wet, move out of that Airbnb, Airbnb. Well, well, he said buy the duplex, but Airbnb one side and, and live in one side, move out then Airbnb both sides, and then, then take that profit buy a couple more and then just start from there. So what, what do you think about that strategy? Yeah. I mean, that's really effectively what I did. Um, you know, I, I did kind of shut it down for a couple of years, but when I started back, I literally just listed a bedroom in my three bedroom house. Um, at some point I moved out and converted the entire thing. So, you know, I rented out the three bedrooms at a time. Um, 2019, I sold that property, bought a duplex. I actually lived in the back of the duplex while mm -hmm. I was um, while I was renovating it, I'll never do that again. That was an interesting experience living in a reno. Yeah. Um, my, uh, my handyman used to knock on the door every morning, like 6am and just go, honey, I'm home. So, uh, yeah, I, hopefully I'll never have to do that again, but, uh, but yeah, definitely. I mean, I've done, done all of those things over the years, um, to try to kind of hack and get to the next level. Um, and frankly, you know, it's, it's, I think at the time it was probably a much more uncommon path. Uh, but I think, you know, that kind of path to financial freedom is much more public publicized now than it was a decade ago. Yeah. Cause I, you know, I talk to people all the time that join my, I've got like a little passive investor group where I, I share deals with them, you know, short, short term rentals or mobile home parks or whatever. And, and, and it's almost like many of them, they have like this analysis by, you know, what is it? Paralysis by analysis yeah. where they're just consuming all this information and and they've been doing it some of them have been doing it for years and they still haven't invested yeah and and it's just like with with the internet and youtube and podcasts there's just there's no way you can keep up with all the information right. typically what i tell them because you know a lot of times they're physicians or dentists i say look you went through your training in medical school or dental school and, you know, you, you were pretty comfortable with it, but, and I asked them, I said, when did you really start to learn? And they said, well, once we started, actually got out and practice, started treating patients. I said, exactly. I said, this is the same thing. You can sit here and learn all day long with, with watching shows or YouTube or whatever, but until you actually get out there and make the investment, you know, it's, you're really hard to learn. Totally. Would you agree with that? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's interesting. I'd like, so I, I have an MBA and actually my wife is a physician. Uh, so I, I think I understand the mentality, I guess, depending on the day she would agree with that or not, but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, so, uh, you know, I, I think now, uh, I got my MBA in 2010. I think now, you know, having several businesses that I'm running, I can understand the applicability, um, from some of those basic, you know, running a business principles, but I've learned way more from failing in real life um, than, than I have from a book. Um, that being said, I mean, I'm always reading, right? That's, there's so much free information out there now. There's no reason not to be consuming content and constantly trying to learn and make yourself better. But you can't, you can't learn um, a specific skill unless you actually try to do that skill, right? And, um, you know, it's the old 10,000 hours. Um, kind Malcolm of Gladwell. Yeah, absolutely. So you know, you can't, you can't get that first hour unless you try. So um, you, you got to give it a shot and and fail. Um, I, I think entrepreneurship really changes uh, your definition and perception of failure. Um, it just changes um, how you view it, right? You view it as part of the process. Um, I don't even look for a 100% answer when I have a problem now. 
Um, there's just so many, so many different solutions, right? It's kind of the, uh, you know, be, be steadfast in your goal, but flexible in how to get there. And so, you know, when we come out with a solution for a problem that, that one of my companies is facing, I hope that it's like a 65 or 70% solution. And then we iterate that along the way. Um, I just, I don't have that level of expectation that anything is going to be perfect. Mm -hmm. uh, and if something doesn't work, then fine. We, you know, we, we alter it, right? I, I'm also grateful and, and fortunate enough to be in a position where no single thing should kill my company. Even if COVID didn't kill it, you know, the worst hospitality recession in the history of the world didn't kill my hospitality businesses. Um, then I'm probably going to be okay. Um, you know, that doesn't mean you don't mo mitigate your, your downside liability, but I also just don't look for perfection right out of the gate. You've got to yeah. iterate the time and it takes failure to do that. Yeah. And you mentioned that, that you like to read a lot and I, and I wanted to point out, I've, I've got it pulled up over here, uh, a, a Facebook post that you posted the end of December of 2022. And it was actually your book list. And it was actually 30 books that you read, which, you know, uh, was impressive is, and I, I don't want to, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I'm going to put you on the spot. <laughs> uh, is, is of the 30, is there, is there any that just really jump off the page is like, you know what, that was the, the top book of 2022 that I read and why. Yeah, I think, uh, so yeah, I, I do that every year. I probably started like 2018 ish. Okay. Um, I try if I don't, I don't just breeze through things. Right. So I try to actually take notes, even if it's an audio book, if it's a good principle, I'll listen to it over and over again. As I take a note on my phone about mm. what the quote was, or if there's a website or reference to, you know, something I need to research more. So, um, you know, it, it, Sounds like a, a decent quantity, but I don't breeze through these things, right? I think in terms of last year, one of the ones that I read uh, towards the end of the year probably impacted me the most, which is um, a book by Mike McCallowitz called Profit First. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's basically, um, if you kind of think about how you automate your 401k or 403b, uh, 457, whatever your plan is that you have uh, through your retirement um, at work, uh, in a W-2, um, the same way that you automate that, it's kind of rewiring the entrepreneur mindset to take your profit first and put that in a separate account. Um, and so, you know, when you, especially as you're growing, right, you, in order to grow a business, you got to have to yeah. reinvest in it. Um, and so you can have potentially smaller margins as you're doing that. Uh, but I think it's important to kind of keep that, um, keep that profit margin going into a separate account. Mm -hmm. uh, kind of have that building over time. A lot of times you see small business owners, um, they don't do that. And so, you know, they get to the end of a 10 year, um, you know, a 10 year of owning a business and they've got nothing to show for it other than the fact that the business hasn't collapsed. Right. Uh, right? But it just kind of changes that mindset of um, allocating profit for yourself first, getting you in the habit of quarterly distributions. And I think, frankly, some of the people that have analysis paralysis, if they could go into it with that, uh, would alleviate a little bit of that uh, because they would see that fruit of the labor, you know, immediately, right? The whole point is to take quarterly distributions as an owner of a business um, every single quarter, you know, starting with the next quarter. Um, and then they kind of give general guidelines for, you know, what should be your basic level of operational expenses, taxes, um, you know, looking at a salary to pay yourself, all those types of things. So, um, yeah, that was probably my my most impactful book um, for last year, just because it kind of changed my mindset a little bit. Uh, right after the book, I, I went to the bank and opened a profit account. Um, and so we've been kind of, you know, using that ever since. So cool. Yeah, one of the books that stood out on your on your list is actually number eleven uh, by Dan Sullivan, which was one of my most impactful books that I've ever read. Is uh, Who Not How? Yeah, and it, it, and I guess to me it really changed my mindset of because any anything that we want to do, um, you know, for for me when I was reading that book. I was contem, you know, I've I've had my blog for about four and a half years. I was contemplating, always going back and forth about starting a YouTube channel, and and I'm reading this book, and it's just, it was just like it was funny because like all the questions that I was asking myself, you know, how do I start it? 
How do I edit the videos? How do I make the thumbnail? How do I come up with the titles? You know, it was like, how, how, how? And it's like, that that's the wrong question to ask. And, and I think so many of us, we get stuck in things and we don't move forward with what we're wanting to do. It's because we're asking that wrong question. And it should be who, you know, find, find the who, you know, they can do it for you. And, and that's it. And once I found that who, actually, I got a coach that actually helped me find So I found the who to actually get me started. And then now that I moved on from him, uh, I've, I've used his series of who's, you know, who can edit it for me while I've got somebody, you know, who can do the thumbnail. And once you have that, you know, that that's pretty much all it takes. But again, it, it's that mindset shift to, to approaching that is, is that kind of what you got out of when you read that book? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's, that's an interesting one, right? So I, you know, I make the comment of like, oh, I don't need to have the perfect solution out of the gate. You know, I look for a 65, 70% solution, but the the reality is when you're staffing, uh, you got to be more right than 65 or 70%. Um, and I, I think that book helped me change that mentality. Um, and, you know, you kind of look at, okay, let's go into this. Here's what, what we think we need. Um, and let's see kind of what the market is and hire the best person, right? And and that book, to your point, I mean, it's more about what exactly does the business need at this phase? And then what does that person look like? And then go try to find it, right? right. Um, and, and yeah, so the 65, 70% solution totally doesn't work with staffing as an entrepreneur. I think you've got to be much higher than that, especially early on. I've, I've got um, probably eight or nine employees now. Um, you know, if you're wrong on number one, two, or three, um, it really is expensive and, and almost can cause failure if it, if you're too wrong. Um, so yeah, totally, um, great book. Uh, I, I'm pretty proud of the list. That's, you know, frankly, as far as, uh, as far as GoBundance is concerned, I, I'm not sure that I've ever gotten a better group of book recommendations um, out of a, a group of folks. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think I think I've had one or two uh, books that weren't amazing um, in the two years I've been in GoBundance. Yeah, and so let's I want to shift gears and go back towards the real estate investing because you know for for us, if you're going to invest in real estate, you know a lot of times you know I, I usually recommend syndications because they're passive and and we can just partner on deals most of them are you know apartments and self-storage you know you got your start with short-term rentals very very rarely do i hear anything about b and b's you know these bed and breakfasts so you got your start in short short-term rentals but you're really focusing on these b and b's why why is that can you tell us a little bit more about that Absolutely. Yeah. It's, so our basic investment framework, um, and I've got a couple partners now on the second B&B as we look to grow the brand. Um, but our basic investment framework is a 10 cap or 25% cash on cash return. And I'm pretty happy to say that our uh, first two B&Bs absolutely are crushing those metrics. So, um, you, you know, to me, that's what the opportunity looked like in short-term rentals a, d a decade ago, six, seven years ago. Um, I mean, I, I've seen deals hit the market now at like a six cap and that's even a reach. Um, so it's, it's just a different environment with inflated asset prices. Um, what I think I've found uh, kind of the operating uh, thesis, if you will, is um, generally these, so you, you, there are two groups of people that um, will own the asset, either uh, kind of mid-tier hospitality groups at this, um, at this property size, um, which they're not probably going to sell unless they want to sell the entire hospita hospitality group. Um, or you may have an owner operator. Typically, it's their last um, gig before retirement. Uh, they probably have owned it for anywhere from five to 20 years. Um, during that time, they probably haven't made any significant um, renovations to the property. And generally, these are more historic homes. Mm -hmm. So you may have some deferred maintenance and certainly uh, I wouldn't say modern amenities by any stretch, depending on the property. Um, and so it's, you know, that's with that demographic, as far as the seller is concerned, probably not overly technology forward. Um, and there's been so much innovation in the space and hospitality uh, from a software perspective and trying to automate and improve the guest experience um, while still having those human beings on site um, that people can reach out to. 
uh, it just it leaves value add. So, I, you know, to your point, I have a short term rental management company. My management company also manages our B&Bs as well. Um, the, our, our last two uh, bigger hires have been hiring um, some guest services concierge folks away from a higher end hotel here locally. Mm -hmm. uh, that's kind of the direction that we're headed is, and just moving up the chain in hospitality. Uh, but it's a very similar value add uh, in, in B and B's that I think I saw in short-term rentals seven to 10 years ago and the valuations in terms of what you're buying in at and what you're getting are also what you were seeing seven to 10 years ago. Um, the, the interesting thing, uh, I think there, because there's a little bit of a moat with people not wanting to, you know, actually make breakfast every morning or, or figure that piece out, uh, or just have the extra labor intensive, you know, piece of having somebody on site. Um, I think there's a little bit of a moat, so a little bit different than a short-term rental and people just, you know, throwing up a listing on Airbnb um, and immediately getting a booking. Um, I think some of that's you know, dying out. There's a lot of bad PR now there anyway. Uh, but I think there's just so much opportunity in the asset class. Uh, I, I know a couple of GoBundance guys that are, are doing this now in different parts of the country. Um, and I just think there's so much opportunity because it's so highly fragmented. It's just a matter of finding the right deals. So um, to me, the, the numbers certainly make sense. Um, I think having weathered the worst hospitality, um, the worst hospitality recession in history has um, kind of proved out this model a bit. Um, and so, you know, that's the next phase for us in terms of scaling this brand is, um, you know, going to, to bring on additional capital, outside capital. Um, so we're excited about the next phase. Uh, I think our first two deals um, really hammer the thesis home. And there's just so much opportunity across the country and, and in the Southeast specifically where we're looking at expanding. And, and to to kind of expand on that, so you you guys have bought some a couple of B and Bs, but now correct me if I'm wrong. Moving forward, you guys are are going to be putting together like a a boutique hotel fund in the future. Is that correct? Yeah. So we uh, can't really launch a, a brand that's a collection until you relaunch number two. Uh, we certainly don't want to put the old brands under this model because the there's such a significant, we're, we're investing between 20 and 30% of each purchase price into uh, renovations. And, uh, and, you know, I've got a partner that does um, historic home renovations, kind of specializes in this, keeping the character while also adding the modern amenities. Uh, with some of these places that haven't been updated in decades. So mm -hmm. you definitely can't relaunch a brand until after that. Uh, we've got our our first one uh, launches, reopens uh, March 18th. We'll shut the second one down June 6th, reopen that around uh, October, early November. And when we do that, we're going to launch the Truvy collection. Uh, Truvy is French for a lucky find, which is how we feel about our, our properties um, so the plan is to grow the True V collection by raising capital uh, beyond those two. Uh, we looked, we'd like to raise, um, we'd like to raise funds, and uh, frankly, just with what the capital we have between the first three partners, uh, we've got enough for the next two deals. Mm -hmm. uh, we want to buy two more in uh, 2023. So, um, in theory, by the time we launch the brand itself, we should have at least closed on that third property, if not identified the fourth. Um, and that's kind of the the plan for the next 12 months um, with raising capital going into uh, 24. Gotcha. Um, so if people want to learn, I mean, you got a very interesting uh, journey that you've come from and, and you're definitely a mover and shaker and, and doing other things as well. People want to connect with you, learn a little bit more about what you're doing now in the future is the best place to go is to the Josh Hatter website? Yes. Okay. Yeah, that's the best place. Uh, so just joshhatter.com, J-O-S-H-H-A-T-T-E-R.com. Uh, -E like the Mad Hatter, I've been saying that for uh, my 41 years of life. Uh, but there's actually a Calendly link directly on that site. Okay. Uh, if somebody um, is interested in the asset class, uh, I'm always happy to talk about, you know, leaving corporate America and taking the leap from leaving a W-2. Um, I, I have obviously a lot of passion about that. Um, life's too short not to pursue what you're passionate about. So 
Um, you know, if anybody's heading that direction, I'd love to chat with folks. And then if anybody's interested in the asset class, um, I wouldn't say I'm the only guy doing it, but it certainly is unique at this point in the cycle. Um, so yeah, I think there's a ton of upside opportunity um, and we're building out our investor list at this point. Excellent. Well, uh, thanks. Thanks for uh, taking time to uh, uh, educate us on not only the, the short-term rentals, but definitely a, a new and emerging asset class with the B&Bs. And I'll, uh, I'll make sure that I'll put the link uh, below this video for anybody that wants to find out more about you or like you said, connect with you with your Calendly, Calendly link. Perfect. Thank you so much, man. I, I appreciate you having me. Um, everybody's time is valuable. Uh, it's the one asset we can't buy or replace. So uh, thank you for spending it with me. It means a lot.